easy. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is a fun class to teach. I'm really excited about it. My name's uh, Dr. Greg Smith. Welcome, everybody. I'm learning your name, so there might be a few people that come in a little bit late, so we've got a few chairs left over. And welcome to everybody. There's actually people live right now looking at us through the camera here. There's Derek, right? All right. Um, from all over, <laughs> Derek just said hi. From all over the United States and the world coming in, uh, and even as the week progresses, uh, other students will be joining us via a, recorded, a recording of the class content. So it's an exciting time to be, you know, involved in teaching theologic, theological education. And uh, I was saying to someone earlier, I just uh, spent a week down in uh, Trinidad and Tobago in the uh, port of Spain, the, the, the city down there. Hey, guys, come on in. Um, teaching theological education. I was down there teaching Old Testament uh, and uh, with about uh, 25 uh, pastors down there from the Caribbean islands, and that was a lot of fun. We've got a few students coming in from Cayman, just as an example. So it's, a, you know, again, it's just an exciting time. Let me open us in prayer, and then we'll cover some logistics about the class, just to make sure we're all on the same page. I've uh, been active in Blackboard, as you may have seen already, throwing some things into Blackboard for us. We'll talk about that and uh, how, how to organize your life around this class, and then we'll get started with some uh, exciting things in the Old Testament. So how's that sound? Anybody, you're all, you're all in? You're all good? All right. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the beginning of this semester in this class. I thank you for these men and women and their um, desire to learn the Old Testament. Lord, we just pray that uh, every step of the way that you'd be with us and um, you'd speak to our hearts and our minds, um, not just filling our minds with head knowledge, but more importantly, heart knowledge. And uh, as I've heard from so many students, Lord, the ability to Make the Old Testament come alive for the people in their congregations or their youth groups, their Sunday school classes. And as so many of these students are involved in ministry, as they're taking this class, I'm just thankful for them and their ministries. Bless them this, this uh, semester. This class would be, uh, uh, would be a helpful class for them as they're active in ministry, not, as, not a hindrance. But it would be supplemental to what they're already doing and reaching lives and touching hearts. So, Lord, uh, grant us this day the ability to think clearly and uh, to help us to stay awake this afternoon and uh, allow this uh, time together to be a blessing. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, so let me just talk you through how many of you, a lot of you I see and know from before, but if you've been around my class, I try to do a really good job of organizing the class in Blackboard. So as you, if you've not, how many of you have not logged into our class in Blackboard? You're all good. Wow. Y'all get an A for the day. So as you log in, anybody have any questions about how to navigate the class? You're kind of finding your way around pretty well so far. There's a navigation pane, and I today posted kind of a how to navigate the class short video, as well as a, if you need any help, if you've never done the um, group discussion, weekly discussions, I call them. There's a little how-to video that I, I turned on today if you need a little help with that. So, you know, you're not behind in any way. Don't, don't, don't freak out. You're, you're right where you need to be. Week two now has the uh, reading quiz, uh, which the title that you see in the quiz aligns with the syllabus, which aligns with the chapter in your book. So that's kind of how we're proceeding. Um, just on the, a note on those quizzes, they're always, oh, Rebecca, you came in late. Welcome back. Um, the reading quizzes are always live. They're always available in the week that they've been basically assigned. So if you fall behind a week on your reading qu quizzes, I don't encourage you to fall behind, but I know that life happens. Many of you are involved in ministry. You're taking your youth groups on mission trips. Some, I've already got some emails from some of you. The nice thing about this class is it's uh, very flexible. So you can get caught up with the reading quizzes and I don't take points off for that. Uh, the weekly discussions, I'm changing up my game from last semester. So those weekly group discussions, the questions that we ask there are largely coming out of this classroom discussion. So what you do, you've been assigned to a small group of eight to 10 students, mixed up. 
So some of the students you meet up with, you'll see their picture. You don't see them in class because they're an online student taking the class. And they may be from some other country in the world. You'll just get to know them this week and read their story for the getting to know you exercise. Actually, from week one folder from last week is where I put that group discussion. And then there'll be another one that you'll see show up in week two. That'll be posted probably first thing in the morning after I think about what question I want to ask based on how far we got in content today. Does that make sense? Now, I'll give you a week with a little bit of grace, but don't take advantage. I want you to get those weekly discussions. You've got one full week to get on that train, and then the train leaves the station. Does that make sense? So come next week, week three will be live, and then there'll be a group discussion for week three. So week two is where we're at now. You've got a week to get that discussion done, and then I'll ask by teaching assistant. By the way, Patrick Jansen, raise your hand. He's, he always sits up here. Uh, you can always ask him a question, or you can email me and ask me a question as you have questions along the way. But what Patrick will do is he'll basically deactivate that group discussion when he's when you know when so that we move on to the next week. Yeah, that was for emphasis. However, that happened. Whose whose computer was that? <laughs> Make sure you mute it if you don't yeah. zoom in the class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's watching that closely. We're also using some new technology this semester called Zoom, so that'll provide a much better quality for the live interaction. Hopefully, you're all seeing it very well and hearing it very well, as well as uh, the recording that we're also producing. Um, so each weekly folder will be organized with basically these items. You'll have the reading quiz for that week. Those never turn off. The group discussion link, you've got a week to complete that. Now, you only have to do 10 out of 14. 14 weeks in the semester, you only have to do 10. So if you've got a crazy week or there's some reason you can't do one, just don't do it. You're just not going to, you know, you keep doing the other ones. Um, if you do over 10 at the end of the semester, I'll give you extra credit. So you have 10 is what I'm asking you to accomplish during the course of the semester. So there's even built flexibility built into that, all right? Let's see, so reading quiz, group discussion, PowerPoint set for this week. So if you wanna go log into Blackboard and download the PowerPoints set that I'm gonna be talking about today, you'll see the advantage there is you'll have speaker notes. So those are notes to, you, to basically, I write them to myself your absent-minded professor, so I can stay on track with what I want to talk about and make, make sure I cover the ground that I need to in class. But you'll benefit from those as well because if you're following along at home, you'll see the PowerPoints line up with what's on the screen in class and on the recording. So everybody can kind of stay on track with how we're progressing through the material. So, and those are also really helpful for studying uh, and reviewing, right, for the midterm and the final that we'll have later in the semester. Then, magically, very close to the end of class, if not, and, and certainly in the same day, Patrick's still nodding. Good, 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 all right. Patrick will help me get the YouTube links to the recorded content to the lecture. It's basically the lecture recordings will be made available via a YouTube link in the Blackboard for that week. For, for example, today's lectures will be in week two. So for everybody at home, that'll benefit them. They'll be able to catch up with the course content pretty quick and then accomplish the assignments uh, like, it, like all of us are as well. So that's basically what you'll see each week. Reading quiz, group discussion, PowerPoints posted, and the classroom content recordings links to YouTube. Everybody in the world use YouTube, except for Chinese because it's blocked, but in China. But other than that, everybody else is watching YouTube videos pretty well. So that's why we, we do that YouTube. And I've got a playlist in YouTube of all the course content lectures. So everybody can, can watch that, live stream that as well. So any questions on that so far? Yes, sir. So how many group discussions do we have to do right now? Are we, are we behind one if we haven't done any or what? Last week I put one in week one. That was just basic get to know you. So it gives you instructions to post your picture in Blackboard, answer the question, share about yourself, introduce yourself to your group. Those are very low, low kind of, I want you to do that one. Everybody should do week one. That way, everybody in your group gets to know you. Good question. 
All right. Any other questions? Let's, uh, here we go. Eventually, I'll get everybody's name here in class. And um, just to give you a heads up, anybody of you that get into the weekly routine of um, viewing the synchronous live link, if you're an online student, we may do something kind of new and radical this semester. Using the technology, and Patrick's going to help me uh, oversee this, we'll have some of our online live students reading scripture. And you'll hear them reading from home, wherever they are. So they're hearing us read scripture. I'll call on students to read scripture uh, over the course of the afternoon. So just have your Bibles ready to go. See the Bibles? Oh, everybody's got your Bible. That's good. Um, all right. So um, you'll hear me and you'll see me. Sometimes I like to have fun just sharing, you know, goofy pictures. And in Blackboard, I'll post shots from my family or some weird random event that happens to me. Um, like over the weekend, the picture on the left, that's my son, James, also a bearded one. Like he'd be inspired by some of you guys. And his wonderful bride-to-be, Abigail. We were at a house over the weekend for a wedding shower. And uh, they got lots and lots of presents, and that was fun. There I am with my daughter, Hannah, glamour shot of Hannah. We're at a lake down there in South Texas with my wife, Ellen. So that's my family. Um, and also, I'm not showing you a picture of my mother-in-law yet, but my mother-in-law, Stella, lives with us during some of the year. She'll be back in about two weeks, I think. Uh, she also lives with us. And we have two cats named Snow and uh, Mary Poppins, Snow White and Mary Poppins, you get the basic theme, and our dog, Enli. So I bring up my dog, Enli, because this next picture is not a picture of Enli. This is a picture of a dog that attacked us Saturday night walking through our neighborhood. And this is why I'm still, I'm still, tr I'm recovering from the trauma. So if I can get through today, I'll be okay. But this dog, started walking from a shadowy place from a yard. We were just turning a corner, and this dog just kept walking towards us, didn't stop. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like this. This dog is, you can see this dog's huge, right? And it's part pit bull, part, it's one of those fighting dogs. I found out later it's a rescue dog, which could probably explain its aggressive personality. But it obviously gotten out of its pen. It was not, not supposed to be free like that. So this dog kept walking towards my dog. We have a little Welsh corgi, you know, named Enli. And uh, so this dog was making a beeline. So I stepped in front of the dog. I wasn't sure if the dog was going to go after us. It looked like it was going after our dog. So, and it wasn't stopping. It went right through my legs and then aggressively started, I think, trying to bite our dog. So I got my dog kind of, I jerked it up by the leash. My dog was probably a little bit airborne at the time. I was trying to get my dog in my hands so this dog wouldn't be able to attack it. Well, that didn't work because I jerked the leash or the collar off of my dog. So now my dog is without collar and is being attacked by this dog. So what I ended up doing, I can't remember all the details. It happened so fast. I, I, I made an aggressive move and got this dog off of my dog, letting my dog free for, for about just a few seconds. My dog knows the, knows the routine. It's now making a quick beeline up the road back home, not looking back. So <laughs> I, I saw this dog, and I started walking too because I was going to catch up with my dog and get it back on the leash. But I noticed this dog kept walking up the street after us. It wasn't running. It was walking. And I kept turning around. Now, Ellen, had she, she, she took the long way home because she just was getting out of that situation. We didn't know what this dog was going to do. So I said, go home, go that way. I'm going to get in line. So this dog keeps following us up the road. Finally, I just did the aggressive move. I took a step. I said, go home. You know, <laughs> That dog finally stopped and just stayed there. Now, this picture was taken at night. I drove back in my car, of course. And I was looking for the dog. I actually found the dog. It was still outside. So I took a picture by this uh, where I think the dog lived because it had made its way back home. That was, and, and so the next day, last night, this happened Saturday. So last night I actually 
took my phone of this picture, went up and knocked on the door of the person's house. So it ends up being a single mom. She's rescued 25 of these kinds of dogs in her, you know, she's into dog rescue. So this is just one of many dogs that have had a second chance in life. And I told her, you know, what had happened. She was very apologetic and was sincerely sorry for what happened. But she explained what had happened. So in her backyard, she's got uh, like one of those bar type jail looking fences with, with narrow bars. And I've seen this dog in the backyard. I mean, this dog is, you, when it barks, you, you know it's barking at you. But there's a little narrow space uh, between her fence where it ends and the neighbor's wood fence. So the wood fence kind of drapes around the front of her house. And she took me over there and showed me this dog had gotten, she didn't know it, but she had locked this dog into that little space in between two fences. And it's not the normal, you know, stomping grounds for this dog. So the dog got nervous. She had gone to Fort Worth for dinner with some friends. This dog literally chewed a hole through a wood fence. This huge hole, this dog had chewed a hole just to get out. And you can see the picture right there. It's the, would somebody please help me shot? Do you see that picture over there? He's obviously, when I took his picture, he wasn't aggressive when I drove back, but he was obviously letting me know. I know I've done something wrong. Would somebody please help me get back into my backyard? So you just never know what's going to happen, right? You just got to be ready for all things. Hey, I don't know why I brought that up. Who asked me about this? It's somebody's fault. I don't know. Let's turn to uh, Zechariah chapter 14. If you've had me before in OT1 or OT3, um, you see that I talk about this idea. So I'm bringing it back, merely, not merely as a refresher, but for some of you it's brand new. But it's a, an important idea that I want everybody to, to grasp because it helps us. It has a huge explanatory force with regards to trying to understand all of the Old Testament books, all 39. You, I could almost make a case that every single book of the Old Testament, you can fit in to the idea that I'm about ready to show you. So it helps you with a big picture. I call it a theological train that takes you from the beginning and the end or the bookends idea. The beginning and the end. I'm sorry. We're not there yet. There we go. The beginning and the end of the Old Testament. So if you have a book you're reading, you know, if you're a cheater, you go to the last chapter, right, to see what happens, you know, so you kind of know where the book's going. Have you, have you ever done that, Rebecca? Cheated like that? You're, you're, you're on the straight and narrow. You only read a book from the first and follow it all the way to the end, right? Right, you don't. <laughs> yeah, what's the point if you, you, you miss out? But in some cases, there's an advantage to... Uh, knowing how a book ends. And it's interesting, as we look at the Bible and we think about the books, the reason I go to Zechariah is because it's got a clear, very vivid place where this, this idea it shows up in the text. And Zechariah is one of the last prophets, the last speaking prophets. We have the post-exilic prophets. If any of you had me for OT3, we talked about the post-exilic prophets. Uh, Zechariah, uh, Haggai and the famous Italian prophet Malachi, right? No, Malachi. I still tell that joke. Remember that joke? Malachi, the Italian prophet. Austin here had me uh, as an undergraduate student in my OT1, in my Old Testament class uh, way back when. You remember I always tell that joke, the Italian prophet Malachi. So. Malachi? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So what we're going to find in uh, Zechariah is a message that the, the Lord was giving to the prophet as a means of encouraging the faithful remnant. This is the post-exilic time. So this is the group that came out of exile, out of uh, Babylon, as a result of the per, uh, Cyrus decree in 538 B.C. So they go back under the leadership of Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. They rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple, rebuild their covenant community. And this is the encouragement that Zechariah is giving them. So let's turn to Zechariah chapter 14. And you'll see that one of the big themes that uh, emerges, especially from the prophets, as a means of encouraging the faithful remnant, is this theme of the day of the Lord. It's a huge theme. It's prophetic. 
uh, a word of encouragement. And you see he announces the day of the Lord in chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided up among you. Skip down to uh, verse uh, 6. And it will come about in that day that there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle for it be a unique day which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And it will come about in that day that living waters, right, will flow out of Jerusalem. Half of them towards the eastern sea and the other half towards the western sea. It will be summer as well as, as in winter. Now here's, there's that one idea in verse 8 and then verse 9. And the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, you see that in your translation. You know that's referring to the covenant name Yahweh from the Hebrew, if it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. So Yahweh, Yahweh will be king over all the earth in that day. Yahweh will be the only one, and his name the only one. So what we're going to do from Zechariah, um, and we see here Zechariah getting this image as a prophet with his prophet hat on, hearing from the Lord, but it's this picture that we want to paint. So it's this threefold idea. Uh, God is king. And then you see the idea of one name. His name is, is the only one. And then that idea that we saw from verse 8, the verse right before it, which is the idea of water. But also this is the picture that we have from other prophets it's the idea of life, or you could say blessing. So on the day of the Lord is this picture that emerges, and we're going to see this, this idea is, if we study the prophets, remember it came up so, so many times. God is king, Yahweh is his name, and his name is the only one. And as a result of he, he being on his throne, water, life, or blessing will be extended, right, to the nations. So this is a prophetic picture that we have. It's the la it comes from the last chapter in the Bible, technically, because God is speaking to these, the faithful remnant through these prophets. Zechariah being one of the last prophets to be hearing from and speaking to this group. So now what we want to do is um, look at this. Oops. There we go. Um, ask ourselves the question, well, Zechariah represents one of the last biblical authors to speak. What's the example of one of the first biblical authors to speak? It is possible that author A and author B could maybe be seeing, seeing, seeing and saying somewhat of the same thing. And I'm going to say and, and recommend that the answer is yes. If we have the bookend idea, we want to go back to the Bible's, one of the Bible's first authors, that is Moses. We're going to talk about Moses. And I'm going to argue and show you that I think Moses and Zechariah are seeing the same basic thing with regards to this picture of the day of the Lord. Let me show you where that shows up. So if we go back to uh, Genesis, let's do this. Now I'm going to say this now. Um, understanding this bookends idea will be very helpful for us as we get into our primary book, starting with Samuel, and understanding Samuel and the book of Kings, First and Second Kings, uh, First and Second Chronicles. This idea is going to be extremely helpful, because it's, it helps us, it gives, gives us a lot of explanatory force in understanding what's going on in these history books that we'll be studying as well. But going back to Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, uh, we will look at all of, uh, you're familiar with what happens in chapter 1, of course. All of the details with regards to the creation of the world. God's creating the domains in which living things will be created and put into those domains for various purposes. Uh, and um, we get to the climactic uh, text here in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. So Moses writes, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. And by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done 
and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. And then when we see capital G-O-D, that's the Hebrew word Elohim. So that's more of a, you might say, think of that as a broader reference or term that is used to describe God. So, so far we've seen capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, that's his covenant name. And then we see G-O-D, which is Elohim, referring to the same God, of course. And by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. Verse 4, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Yahweh God made heaven and earth. Did you hear it? Moses has just given us a huge Huge theological point and emphasis in those four verses. Now, we might read over that, but I'm just going to slow it down a little bit and, and amplify it a little bit louder. This is the first time that we see the covenant name Yahweh used in the entire Old Testament. And Moses, the author, has his remind. Remember, Moses is the author who also shared the experience of being at Mount Sinai with Israel, God's chosen people, he's witnessed the, this, this God, Yahweh, is the one who brought, it, brought his people, Israel, out of Egypt to eventually getting to Mount Sinai. He's the one who comes down on the mountain, Mount Sinai, introduce, introduces himself with the full force of his presence, and then by this name, I am Yahweh. He's the one, Moses says, by the way, he's the one, you all met at Mount Sinai, is the one who is the creator of the universe. He's the one responsible for creating everything and sustaining and creating all living things. Yahweh is his name. But not only that, notice what this creator does. He does this. And in the ancient world, when you do this and you command everything around you to do the same, who are you? You're a king. See? So not only is Yahweh, now when we come up to our bookends idea, but now we see a connection. Moses is making the same theological point to his audience. Israel, I would argue, if you have, if you've not had me for OT1 yet, the Pentateuch, the context for this is, I, I, I say Moses is the instructor, and the whole Pentateuch is about getting Israel ready for the promised land. Last stop, Plains of Moab, which is about 20 miles east of Jericho, across the Jordan River. So this is, what, this is an important theological lesson for Moses in preparing Israel for the promised land. Yahweh is his name, right? So we've got Yahweh is king front and center in the very first portion of the of the old testament so yahweh the significance of the name yahweh is going to be front and foremost here we're going to come back to that a lot but then we're not done we have another it's kind of a cute picture um once we get the name yahweh established yahweh is king now moses is going to unpack the implications of that name that name Yahweh now is going to be stamped at a particular, on, a, on a particular living critter, critter, namely us, right? Humanity. So Genesis, uh, if we see in chapter, uh, chapter 1, Moses talks about the pinnacle of creation, that is human beings, Adam and Eve. Humanity is the pinnacle of creation. God made... Uh, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, chapter 1, verse 26, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male, female, he created them. And then he blessed them, and he gives them the first to-do list. You know, these are the commands. What are we going to do to express this new thing called humanity? Fill, multiply, rule, and subdue is what we're going to do. All as an expression of, of the name of Yahweh. 
So in other, in other words, this is the point that I make. Humanity, human beings have a unique role in the created order to bear, to, to bear the name of God, to bear the name, to carry and bear that name, right? So as humanity, we are unique. We are like little kings is the idea. God created us in a unique image as an extension of his image. It's stamped on us. That means we're different than other created things, other living things. Humanity has a unique role, not just fill, multiply, rule, and subdue, but all of those things that we talked about in OT1 with regards to what does it mean to bear and carry the name of, of, of Yahweh? We represent him. You know, we represent his name. And the idea of name means more than just name. In the uh, Old Testament context, it's also the idea of reputation. Reputation. Maybe you've heard that before with the uh, one of the Ten Commandments. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. It's not, it's the idea there is not just cussing and swearing. Certainly part of it. But even deeper than that, we've got a violation of misrepresenting his reputation by what we do. That's a violation of the Ten Commandments, one of the Ten Commandments, misrepresenting his name or his reputation. So you can see now we're, we're, uh, we've got now the idea that Moses is giving us here is that being created in the image of God is also the equivalent of bearing... I say bearing the name. That's our job. That's what's written on our t-shirt. And for Israel, as Moses is preparing them for the promised land, that's what they're going to plant, put on the flag that they plant. They're going to establish the name Yahweh in the promised land. And that's what they're going to do uniquely, corporately, right, as a nation, but also individually. Uh, they're also getting this theology. So individuals making up the community, the covenant community, we're all representing the name and the reputation of the name Yahweh. Uh, and they're going to have to do that, right, against all kinds of opposition in the promised land. By the way, there's already people there, and they're practicing pagan paganism. Infant sacrifice, child sacrifice, all those things that pagans do, is that's what's going on in the promised land. So to bear and plant the flag Yahweh means there's going to be a conflict that's going to ensue. But we, we, we talk about that in OT1. But last uh, and not least, we've got one more picture with regards to the last thing, water, life, and blessing. You probably know where I'm going with regards to this. Moses uh, identifies with regards to life a particular part of the garden, which is a tree of life, right? The tree of life. And you see the details there in chapter 2, verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord got caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So this tree comes, this tree of life comes with a command. Eat. Eat this one, don't eat this one. Eat from this one, don't eat from this one. So again, we see that life is located with regards and is closely held to the idea of the command. So the, the idea of life and blessing. Um, what we see at the very end, the bookend idea, is that when God comes back and is throned or rethroned as king, the idea that he's, his name is the only one, his is the only reputation around, no pagan gods, you know, no, no, no Baal at that time. It's just one. What we'll see is this water start to flow, flowing this picture of the water flowing from the throne and the life and the blessing. So really what we have in the Garden of Eden is the same basic idea with regards to the tree, and that connects us to the idea of the, of the water and, and the blessing and the life that we see in the picture, the prophetic picture of the day of the Lord. So all three elements are foundational to Moses. And um, I think Moses, you know, part, part of his job description as he served the people was prophet as well. He's seeing something in this, terms of this vision. He's, he's hearing from the Lord. And these are foundational, these are foundational ideas that we're going to see uh, that will come back in our assessment of 
Israel's monarchy uh, during the time of the, of the kings, starting with Samuel and then moving through those books. Um, we're going to see this crisis over, over kingship that starts to come about. A crisis over bearing the name, carrying the reputation of God, representing the name of Yahweh. And uh, what that does for the short-circuiting of, of life and blessing that's going, uh, that's, you know, that should be, should be flowing, but it, uh, it gets shut down sometimes. We're going to see that coming up. So back to the basic bookends idea. So Moses and Zechariah, I use as kind of this bookend idea. One biblical author near the end and another author near the beginning, establishing this theological idea. So let's just keep this up here for now, and let's move to uh, where I think it helps us in connecting to uh, our first book, and that's the book of Samuel. Now, if I had my druthers, we'd have Judges and Ruth included in this class. Uh, unfortunately, it ends the OT1 class. That's as far as we get in OT1 is, is the book of uh, Ruth. Um, but we, we need to have a conversation about uh, Judges and Ruth because of this idea and, and what we're going to uh, see here. So let's take a look at the book of Judges. And if you had me for OT1, this is a little bit of a review, but I think it's necessary because of what we're talking about here. So you know the book of Judges is a unique book. The author, um, the author of Judges, is giving us history, but he's also giving us theology. He's, a his, he's giving us historiography, is what we, what we call it. And his thesis statement in the book of Judges is found in the very last chapter, very last verse of his book. So let's take a look at that in chapter 21, verse 25. Let's see, have uh, Joel up here in the front. Could you read that for us? <laughs> Uh, chapter 21, verse 25? Yes, sir. Uh, first Samuel? No, that's Judges. Ah, no wonder I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> in those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Okay, you've probably heard that before, right? Um, that's the thesis statement of the entire book of, of Judges. And um, what we have in the book of Judges is an entire book. If you've ever read or studied the book of Judges, you know it's kind of a, a dark book. It's one example after one example after another example of people doing what was right in their own eyes. That's the whole point the author's making in the book of Judges. Well, let me give you another example of people doing what was right in their own eyes. Here's another example of people doing what was right in their own eyes. And we have this thesis statement, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everybody did what was right in his own eyes. And it's repeated again over in uh, chapter 17, again. But the author leaves us with this question. Um, uh, he leaves us with this, with this whole historical record of this 400-year period, example after example after example of everybody doing what was right in their own eyes. And one way of looking at that thesis statement is asking ourselves this question. Is the author of Judges supposing or, or, or suggesting that the way out of this mess, the spiritual 400, year, 400 years of spiritual chaos, is the solution going to be found in an earthly king? Is that what we're waiting on? Because that's what comes next. If we skip over the book of Ruth, we get into 1 Samuel, as we'll see. We, we are, it's not long before we're introduced to Israel's first king, King Saul, right? So this, this idea of king or kingship is front and foremost uh, at this time in history, uh, and certainly a part of the, you know, the theological high point here of the authors. So is that, is that what we, we, we ask ourselves the question, is that what the author of Judges has in mind, and I don't think so. You've had me for OT1, you know why, but for those of you who are new, let me explain what I mean. I don't think that's all that the author is looking at. Of course kings are coming. That's going to 
be just around the corner after we get out. After Samuel's raised up, we'll see. You know, we're going to get ourselves out of this mess, hopefully, over time. Eventually, we'll get to King David. You know? So is that what we have in mind here? Here's an idea that uh, I want to introduce to, to uh, uh, for those of us uh, that you did. If you, this is an idea I introduced last time, last semester as well. But in the ancient world, there's this idea of the language is harsh, but it's killing or forgetting kings, killing a king or forgetting uh, a king in the ancient world. And it's interesting that in the ancient world, you could, in correspondence, king to king, as kings are writing to each other, you could talk about a king being killed without the king actually being dead. It's an interesting idea. And here's just one example of where it shows up. This is actually taken from some ancient, ancient correspondence. Uh, on one or at one occasion, uh, Masawuwa's brothers caused him trouble. They killed him. How did they kill him? Well, here's some of the clues. They drove him out of the land. He came to my father's presence, and my father did not reject him. So here's an example from Acadia, Acadian correspondence. And we get the basic idea. Killing a king involves dethronement, dethroning a king, and driving him from his land. That's how you kill a king. Um, this is kind of a, in the, in the correspondence uh, between kings in the ancient world, they're always using this, this covenantal type language as they write to each other. So typically this kind of killing was done when one king was in breach or violation of covenant relationship that's been defined. So a covenant relationship established between two kings. One king will say, hey, you've not been following through with your end of the bargain, the deal, the agreement. So I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to drive you from your land and dethrone you. So you'll cease to exist as a king, in other words, is the idea. So in this case, uh, the, 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 the top king or the suzerain king would dethrone and banish a vassal king from the land, and even though the vassal is still living. All right, so that's basically the idea. Now we're building on this because I'm coming to come back to this idea of, of, of this idea of Yahweh being king or, or God being king. Um, so we, 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 now let's bring in some other ancient discussion with regards to this, and we go back to our first author, Moses. And let's turn to his book in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8. And in Deuteronomy, chapter 8, Moses is going to instruct Israel and give them some warnings with regards. In other words, don't do this. <laughs> and here's what he says in chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 11. Let me have, uh, let's see. Thomas in the back. Could you read for us? Yeah, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting in verse 11. Until I tell you to stop. Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Least when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them. <clears throat> And when you heard the flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. Keep going. And your heart will be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness, with his fiery serpents and scorpions, and thirsty ground, where there was no water. Who brought you water out of the filthy, Flitty rock who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might humble you and test you to do the, you good in the end. Beware at least you say in your heart, my power and might of my hand have gotten me this well. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get well, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And if you forget the word of your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today 
and you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord make to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Okay, thanks. So here's what Moses is warning um, Israel about. The idea is forgetting God. And how do you forget God? You forget him as king. In other words, you ignore who he is. You ignore and forget the significance of his name, the name Yahweh, his reputation. So these things are, are forgotten. And the idea of forgetting um, here is, is linked more than just Israel's proud heart, but just general lack of acknowledgement of Yahweh who's in their midst. So replacing Yahweh. Let's see. We don't want to worship Yahweh anymore. If we do, we'll still talk about him, but we're going to add other gods to the list. This is called religious syncretism. Syncretism is an idea that's important. Um, syncretism. This is what syncretism is. It's Yahweh plus, fill in the blank, Baal, Moloch, any of the pagan gods of the ancient world that were in and around that time. If we do this, Moses says, if you do this, Israel, you're going to forget Yahweh, right? And this is a way of technically, at least from your vantage point, dethroning God as king, forgetting him, forgetting he's, he's your king. He's the one who's your king. And you see this in the details of uh, the text here in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And you see the language at the end of that, that chapter. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish because you would not listen to the voice of Yahweh, your God. This idea of perishing as a nation really comes back to this idea. What happens when a nation ceases to exist as a nation? They perished. They're, they've been technically killed as a nation. They cease to exist. Why? It's because their, their king has been dethroned, and they've been exiled from their land and their temple has been destroyed. So when, when Judah, the southern nation, is exiled into Babylon, all three things happen. And exactly what Moses warns against happens eventually to, to the southern nation of Judah and to Israel in the north. But Judah, they lose their king, their king is dethroned, they've lost their, their land, and they lose their temple. Their temple's been destroyed. When those three things happen, a nation ceases to exist. And then they go into exile for 70 years. But uh, so if we go back to uh, the book of Judges, and we remind ourselves of the thesis statement of the author of Judges, there was no king in Israel. Everyone, be, you know, everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. That idea there was no king in Israel is that merely just a statement of a historical fact? Well, there was no king during that 400-year period. Is that what the author's saying? No, I don't think so. I think it's, see, he's saying much more than that. He's saying that, no, this 400-year period called the Book of Judges was 400 years of Israel forgetting their king. There was no king in Israel because 400 years of Israel practicing syncretism, which is throughout the whole book of Judges, spiritual problem, they're forgetting Yahweh as king. They've forgotten him. They've dethroned him. And I think the picture is, you know, kind of like this. So, the, the, you know, the author of Judges is not just looking forward, like there's this vacuum, no king needs to be filled. No, he's making a theological assessment of the whole 400-year period called the Book of Judges. There was no king because the people have forgotten. And that's what Moses warns against. So that's what I see happening here. Um, and the whole Book of Judges is just one huge amplification of what forgetting the Lord Yahweh looks like. One example after another. Um, however, I, I think that there's more to be said even about the look, not just the look back, 
but from this vantage point, this, this look forward. Because when you read the book of Judges, you also want to read the book of Ruth with the book of Judges. Those two books go hand in hand. So if we, if we look at the book of Ruth, the author of Ruth has given us, I think, the look ahead. If the, book, if the author of Judges is kind of, if, you, if you're tracking with me, giving us the look back, the, the, the book of Ruth helps us to focus on the look ahead. And that's because the author of Ruth also gives us a significant thesis, thesis statement in, in that book, in his book, um, in the look ahead. So let's look at the book of Ruth. And I, like I said, this book needs to be read with the book of Judges. Um, the, book of, um, the book of Ruth reminds us that in the midst of this 400-year period of spiritual chaos, there exists a faithful community or faithful communities still around covenant communities. And particularly one town that we, call, we, we meet up with, uh, Boaz, coming from the town of Bethlehem. So the town of Bethlehem is the primary setting for the book of Ruth. Now let's take a look at the end of the book of Ruth. You know, you know how the book of Ruth ends. The author here is screaming off the page with regards to his theological high point as it relates to king or this idea of king. So the whole significance of, of Ruth being brought into the household of Boaz and the restoration of the name of uh, Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. Do you know what the name Elimelech means? Elimelech means my God is king. See, that, that's a significant piece of the puzzle. So if you understand that the whole book of Ruth, the whole story of Ruth entering into the covenant community, but Boaz is the hero. He not only brings Ruth in and provides for her and uh, enacts the kinsman redeemer law and the Leverite marriage, but also he's restoring the name of Elimelech, who's dead, his household. My God is king. How, now, how does this happen? Well, let's take a look at the very end. The author of uh, Ruth tells us in verse 16. Let's see. Um, Christina, over here, could you read for us? Ruth chapter 4, starting in verse 16 to the end. And I'll give you an A plus if you pronounce all those names correctly. Hi, are you in Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> it says, Then Naomi took the child, gave him in her lap, and cared for him. Mm -hmm. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of, yeah, I will have to do it in Spanish. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Perez, um, Perez was the father of Hezru, and uh, Hezru was the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amiradab, Amiradab was the father of Nashon. Mm. Good. Nashon the father of Salmon. 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 Good, good, good. Boaz, and Boaz the father of Obed. Okay, so obviously here, good job, you get an A+. Plus. The uh, author here of Ruth, his thesis statement is at the end of his book as well, but now we see that one of the uh, long-term benefits uh, of uh, this whole beautiful story, uh, it's not just a love story between Boaz and Ruth, but there's so much more going on. There's a provision here. So now the line of the Messiah is in, is in full view of the author who's going to point to the, the king, the coming king, and that's, uh, that's King David. So that's the look ahead, I think. So if you read the book of Judges with Ruth, you've got this theological assessment looking back 400 years of when there was no king in Israel. And now you have the wonderful story of Ruth in the book of Ruth that points us to the fact that there's going to be a coming king. Not only just not any old king, this is King David, and see what I think is, uh, I'll just fill this in a little bit too. I think what we have going on here is at least from the vantage point of the author of Ruth, who, who this person is writing at some time in history, I'd argue sometime not long after 
the reign, or maybe even at the tail end of the reign of King David, perhaps. But you've got, I think here, what's really in view is the what we read about, and we'll get to this eventually in this class, is 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the Davidic covenant. Nathan's oracle to King David. And just look at a couple of the uh, verses here in 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 12. So this is part of the promise. Coming from the Lord to King David, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I'll raise up your seed, your descendant, after you, who will come forth from you, and I'll establish his kingdom. And uh, then down to verse 16. And your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever, and your throne shall be established forever. And you see this in verse 19, David's prayerful response. In verse 19, you see it. And yet this was so insignificant in your eyes, O Lord God, for you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. You see David seeing and catching the implications of this everlasting kingdom that's going to come through one from the seed of his, his uh, you know, genealogy as it tracks forward. Someone, some king's going to come on the scene and um, fulfill this, uh, this, this prophecy. This, this is the Davidic, uh, Davidic covenant. God's making these promises that through David would emerge the, you know, eventually we get to the Messiah. So this looking back, looking ahead idea, I think is going to really now drop right in the middle of our discussion of, 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 uh, of this idea of kings. So when we think of Israel's kings, we have two parallel type stories going on. One is the saga of the struggle uh, with regards to the earthly kings, which we know the history. Another 400 year period, by the way, 120 years during the United Kingdom. And then another 400 year period where there's very few kings given a positive evaluation. If you've ever read those, those accounts. One bad king after another. But during that time, God raises up another voice. He can't, he can't use bad kings. They misrepresent his name and his reputation to the people. They mislead the people, but God starts to raise up prophets. Prophets will start speaking for God again, and they're going to be the ones to start reminding everybody of this idea again. They're going to come back to Moses. They're going to see this idea of this day of the Lord and this promise of an everlasting kingdom and one coming from the seed of, of King David to establish this throne, um, which is basically the big idea is God being rethroned as king and then Israel recognizing that. So that's coming on the day of the Lord. So um, it's this picture here um, and we have this idea not only in Zechariah 14, let's take a look at another couple places, speaking of the prophets, right? Um, and you'll have my prophets class if you want to take me for OT3 in the fall. We'll talk much, much, much more about this. But let's take a look at Isaiah. I like Isaiah chapter 2. These, this is the reoccurring theme of the day of the Lord as encouragement for the faithful remnant. They're always wondering, the faithful remnant, if they're in exile, they're asking the question, you know, we've lost our king, we've lost our land, we've lost our temple. Has God given up on us? Is their question. Prophets like Isaiah start to answer that question and say, no, God's not given up on you. Now, what will come about in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. And he will be raised above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the Torah will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So let's take a look at uh, Ezekiel, again, chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning in verse 24. And this is an interesting uh, place for, for this um, prophetic encouragement. 
with regards to the day of the Lord, because it comes after the, you know, that passage that talks about them bones, them bones, them dry bones, you know, that whole, you know, story. Weston, you, you heard about that growing up as a kid, saying that song, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. So this, how do, how do dry bones get revived? So this, this is a resurrection of a nation vision. Dry bones will receive um, restoration. They'll, re they'll be restored. How will that happen? And Ezekiel says, he gives us the answer. Look at uh, chapter 37, verse 24. And my servant David will be king over them. And they will all have one shepherd. And they will walk in my ordinances. One shepherd, by the way, is the one king idea. That's the shepherd. That's the role of the shepherd, by the way. He's a, he's a king. God's coming as king through, through David. One from the line of David will be king over them. And uh, they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. And they shall live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived. So the land will be restored. And they will live on it, they, their sons and their sons and their sons after them forever. And David, my servant, shall be their king or prince forever. And I will make a covenant of peace with them. And it will be an everlasting covenant with them. I'll place them and multiply them. There's the idea of life and blessing coming back here. And I'll set my tabernacle or sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them. And I will be their God. And they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. This is all happening on the day of the Lord. So if any of you ever get discouraged in your walk with the Lord, find these passages of the day of the Lord and they'll thrill you. These, these are days that are coming for us. We know that the Messiah is coming again to accomplish these things, to establish his throne, to establish his one name, reputation, and to extend life and restoration and blessings that all of the nations of the world will benefit from as well. Um, so that's, that's what we have that's, uh, that's coming. One last little idea that I want to kind of drop in right here, um, in this idea of, of um, we saw it in Isaiah, the idea of going up to the mountain, Mount Zion, that idea of going up to Mount Zion, which is part of the picture of the day of the Lord that we see so, so often repeated. Let's go to the very, um, let's go to the book of Second Chronicles. And then we'll, uh, after this idea, we'll take our break. I always try to take a break at the top of the hour, but you can see by the clock, it's a little bit messed up. So I've got a clock here. We're at 4.04. Let's turn to Second Chronicles. And um, the significance of the book Second Chronicles, we'll eventually get to this book in this class and talk about it with a little more detail. But at this juncture, I just want to show you, if you think about the arrangement or the canon, how the Old Testament books are arranged, there's various canons that have been in existence at different times in history. The important canon that I like to uh, track with is the canon or the arrangement of the Old Testament books that would be called the Hebrew canon. This is the Bible that Jesus read from. Paul, the early church, this was the Bible that they had. This was the Old Testament Hebrew canon. And the very last book of the Hebrew canon is not Malachi or Malachi, the Italian prophet. No, it's not Malachi. It's Second Chronicles. This is the very last book. That, now let's take a look at the very last book and how it ends. Speaking of endings. And interestingly, it starts with a Cyrus decree. You see the Cyrus decree starts in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 22. And uh, just for fun, let's turn one page over. And I want to uh, ask uh, Austin, why don't you read here, starting in Ezra chapter 1. Let's read the Cyrus decree according to the book of Ezra. One page flip over. And one through, verses one through four. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, 
has given me all the kingdoms of all uh, of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with the silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So Ezra, the historian Ezra, is, is starting his history with the singular event that precipitates the whole return. That's the Cyrus decree. This is the decree that is decreed by the Persian king Cyrus that allows all 25,000 plus of the faithful remnant go back from, you know, exile to return to Jerusalem. Now, one page flip to the left, Austin, I want you to start reading. Interestingly, the author or the historian who wrote Chronicles ends his account with the Cyrus decree. So start reading there in verse 22 to the end. Now in the first year, Cyrus, king of Persia, in the order to fulfill the, uh, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent proclamation throughout the kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, whoever there is among you, uh, of all his people. May the Lord, his God, be with him, and let him go up. Keep going. That's it. Well, there was more. There's more in the Cyrus decree. You just read it in Ezra's account. There was a lot more. What would you just stop reading for? Huh? Are you playing game here with us or what? <laughs> you just stopped reading right in the middle of the Cyrus decree. It's like, where's, what's going on here? Huh? It's, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a longer account in Ezra. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Have you ever noticed this before? It's kind of a... Obviously, we talk about this when we get to Chronicles, but the author of Chronicles is, is giving us a huge, huge the theological emphasis in how the Hebrew canon ends in the very last word, let him go up. And it's interesting, the let him go up language, we saw it in the um, text like, like Isaiah chapter 2, um, and this idea of let him go up, I'll just... Look, this remind us of what we just read in Isaiah chapter 2. It's this, it's this day of the Lord language that we see in the prophets. And in um, you know, Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, and many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up, right, to the mountain of the Lord, Mount Zion. Why? It's the day of the Lord. The king will be on his throne and we'll hear from him as he instructs us in instruction from the Torah and water and blessing and life will flow and extend from the, from the throne. So it's interesting. I, I'll argue that the author of Chronicles is providing us, in the very last book of the Hebrew canon, an invitation to meet the king, the day of the Lord. Go up. Where? Well, to the place where the king is coming. This, this event here and all of these things that are going to take place, um, there's a picture of it right there. You see the water flowing and lying in the lamb laying down in this, this time of peace. But the king, it's an interesting invitation. Let him go up. It's not a far cry from how our New Testament ends in the book of Revelation. If you want to turn there with me, the very last chapter. You see this emphasis on someone who's coming. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, we know the answer. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book if anyone adds to them god shall add to them the plagues which are written in the book and if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy god shall take uh take away his part in the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book he who testifies to these things says in red yes i'm coming quickly and we say amen come lord jesus um the grace of the lord be with us all amen so this invitation this activity of going up and, and coming quickly is a parallel it's interesting the so if you think of the Hebrew canon, the very last word of the Hebrew canon lines up with the very last word of our, our New Testament canon, book of Revelation. And so there's this unanimous voice now of 
the biblical authors recognizing the significance of, of this day in the event when God returns to his throne. And it's, it's, it all kind of connects, doesn't it? See it? See that connection? So on this kind of foundation is what I want us to appreciate. And it'll help us understand, like I said, a lot of the things that we'll be seeing kind of leap out of the, some of those boring history books called Samuel and Kings. And, you know. So anyway, I don't know. There's something funny in the picture. Sometimes my slides have really goofy things. So people point it out to me. I just find these things on Google. So it's kind of a Sunday school picture, but it captures everything there. All right. Well, let's take a top of the hour break, uh, typically for like five minutes. Or if you come back a little bit late, I won't bark at you. I'll just embarrass you. And uh, if you need to go get a cup of coffee or whatever, feel free to do that. And let's, uh, let's get started about uh, 4, let's say 4.15. We can come back and get started. Uh, four, four longer than 4.15. It's 4.12 now.